I have a question. Of all the characters in the parable of the prodigal son, which one would you say was the most unfortunate? The fatted calf. (laughs) Poor thing, he paid the ultimate price for other people's happiness, and he made people very happy, fat and happy. (laughs) Today's gospel is so rich with meaning that at a certain point, at one point or another, we can all identify with any one of the characters, even the fatted calf. Uh, There are so many of you who give your lives one one drop of blood at a time, and that's a beautiful thing. And if we focus on the prodigal son, the story teaches about sin and conversion, that sin is to take the gifts of God and squander them in a distant country, so to speak, that to repent is to realize that sin makes us miserable, and to decide to stop. That conversion requires confession. The son goes to the father and confesses, and that when we confess, God embraces us and gives us a ring and a robe, making us his children. If we focus on the loving father, on the other hand, the parable teaches us about who God is, that God gives us freedom to embrace him in love or to pack up and leave, that God longs for us, runs out to meet us when when we return and focuses on our beauty, on truth, on goodness, and welcomes us back home, that God showers us with grace. And if we focus on the older brother, the angry brother, it teaches us some common errors that we can fall into, such as demanding, demanding the Father come outside to talk to us. We want God to act on our terms. Like the brother saying, not once did I disobey your orders, so we treat God like he owes us favors for obedience. Or the son's complaint that he never got so much much as a young goat to feast with his friends. We want God to serve our goals and not vice versa. And those are all great things to reflect on. It's a rich gospel. But today, I'd like to focus on the Father's house, the household. Many saints see the house of the, in, in, the, in the story of the prodigal son as representing God's church which means all of us together. And when we look at the Father's house as the church, we have to admit that many of us are in fact the older son. Why did the prodigal son leave? Why was the older brother angry? It seems that the brothers didn't like their father and they didn't like each other much either. They didn't like the way their father did things and either tried to avoid him altogether or obeyed him but grudgingly. Of course, the angry faithful brother disliked the carelessly unfaithful brother and the feeling was mutual. I read a great article by an author named Tom Hoops who teaches um, at a Benedictine college. And in that article, uh, he points out that something like that is happening today in our church. Maybe we don't like the way the church does things, and we don't like our brothers and sisters in the church much either. Maybe it's those close-minded traditionalists who want to take us backwards in time. Or maybe it's those progressives who want change just for change's sake. Or we don't like the modernists. Maybe it's those mean people that we don't like. Or maybe it's the people who are too nice, so nice that they never stand up for the truth. We might feel like the older son who did everything right, obeyed and served, but wasn't given as much as a goat to feast with his friends. This author, Hoops, presents his own version of that complaint 
So in his words, he says, All these years I've done my duty by the church, giving of my time, my talent, my treasure. I don't disobey orders. I don't miss mass or confession. I respect liturgical rules. And I even obey humane vitae. If you don't know what that is, just a parenthesis, humane vitae is an encyclical that tells us what the church teaches regarding married love, regarding responsible parenthood, and regarding the rejection of artificial contraception. So he continues, he even observes humane vitae. And then Hoops asks, what do I get in return? The whole church, he says, is built for people who don't care about rules so that I'm the bad guy for want wanting them kept. And he goes on, complaining that because he has more kids, he has nine kids, because he follows Humanae Vitae and accepts all the kids that God sends, he can't afford Catholic school, so he homeschools because research shows that the more kids, the more time kids spend with their parents, the more likely they are to keep their faith. But then he says, and the church barely acknowledges, acknowledges them. So if there are any homeschooled families, I'm acknowledging you, good job. <laughs> and then he points out that many people think that way and keep the church at arm's length. They avoid it. They go parish hopping to make church suit their tastes or simply take what they can get, like the sacraments, and skip everything else. They offer begrudging obedience but they don't offer love. And so he says, he and others like him are acting exactly like the older brother. They want God to act on their terms. They want God like he owes, they, they treat God like he owes them favors for obedience. And they want God to serve their goals, not vice versa. But the fact is that the prodigal son and the older son are not so different. They both had a transactional relationship with the father. One just cashed in all at once. The other extracted, the older son, the angry son, extracted what he wanted over time. And that's the relationship maybe many of us have with the church. Instead, we should participate in parish life and make it more vibrant and faithful and beautiful. So here is what Jesus expects. The first reading from Joshua tells us God delivered the chosen people from slavery in Egypt, fed them, and they are covenant partners from now on. St. Paul describes, or rather, describes how, how Christ took this a step further, incorporating us into God's own family, making us a new creation. And the way he did it was that he became sin so that in killing him, sin would die. So what should all of this look like for us? Today's gospel begins, begins with this phrase. The Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus, so to them, Jesus addressed this parable. That's how the gospel began. So is it difficult? to accept that the sinners, those unworthy in our eyes, the prodigals, the carelessly unfaithful are always welcomed back in the church, then this gospel message is for us. In Hoops' his own words, he says, and the message is this, God is love, and we are love's ambassadors to each other. The Father has forgiven even us, even coming out of the house to meet us because we were too angry to go in. God is love, and he asks us to live in step with his love.